Okay, fun day today. A lot of analogies. I really want to try to, at, by the end of class, I'd love for us to have a better understanding of how muscles are actually working to influence our motion from a, a physics biomechanics standpoint. Not from the physiologists. Those wizards have their own little mechanisms and all their little receptors and all the chemistry stuff that I can't see, so I don't believe. I'm joking. I know it's there. It's, I gotta see it. So we're gonna look at it to understand from a, a, a physics mechanic standpoint that, that stuff that I think we can better understand what's really happening. And once we understand what's happening, then hopefully we can better apply it to figure out what things are working and, and how. So the first thing I have here is a little starfish going across the glass. I love this analogy because it shows basically what's happening with the actin and the myosin inside your muscles, where you have these movable filaments and then you have these other kind of more stabilized filaments and then the small ones move about the big ones. But it's how they move that I think is interesting. Remember on our last test, how we had the person that started here and they did this, and it was bilateral abduction, even though one was kind of free to move and the other one was, was fixed, they both did the same thing. So you see the little cilia that's actually moving, but the ones that are stuck to the glass are also moving. It's like opening closed chain. Right? So like in other words, when I'm walking, when I'm actually moving, even though this leg doesn't look like it's moving, it's actually, the joint is actually moving for me to extend, while the other one is positioning itself by flexing. Good. Now, in our muscles, these little cilia are constantly doing this and that, as long as we're alive, even when we're at rest. There's this constant, I'm trying to shorten on one end that's attached to the myosin, and then Calcium gets and it disconnects out of the ATP and it disconnects and it's constantly kind of doing this silly thing. And the contraction of the work is the sum total of how many things are trying to make you shorten versus how many things are not. So for this analogy, I have a couple of examples of what I'm trying to get to. Is so like when here, if you were doing like a, a maximum effort, um, and you had like uh, isometric contraction with a lot of force, you can see how she's trying to move in one direction, right? She's trying to run, but the external force is <laughs> take her in the other direction, and it's the sum total. Look at how some of her cilia is going this way and some of her cilia is going that way, and it's kind of the end result. It's the sum total. It's the sum of all of those different things, and sometimes the sum equals zero. It's not that she's not trying to go forward, it's that you have the same amount of stuff trying to make her go backwards. She's still working, <laughs> even though she's not moving. Does that make sense? Okay. Another analogy we got to, um, I tried to explain it, but I didn't do a very good job, is the endless pool analogy. Let's see. So for this, it's like a jet stream and you're swimming in place. So if you notice, one of her arms is going here and the other arm is going there and it's the sum total of what's trying to make her move back versus her trying to make her go forward. And if she tries to make herself go forward with more force than what's trying to make her go back, she'll actually move forward. But if she lets the jets take her back, then she'll go back. All while trying to go forward. That's where it gets kind of creepy. She's in control, assuming she's not fatigued out and exhausted. She's actually in control whether she's going to swim forward or go back based on the same forces that she's applying to the water. She chooses to let herself go back or to make herself go forward. A majority of activities that they live in and in the weight room, we are going to choose whether that weight is greater than us. The only time, and it's so rare, is if you're doing like a set to fatigue and you're trying and all of a sudden it starts to come down. Like, that's the only time where like it's in control is if I can't generate enough force, but that's so rare. And especially with the people that we're gonna be working with, they're gonna be in control of the motion in both directions with the same paddles that are trying to go in one direction. 
Okay? All right, I have this one last analogy that I'd like to give before we get into the heart of the lecture today. And that is this. I know it's impressive graphics. I did it 20 minutes ago. So consider we have a faucet and we really have, and I know it's a continuum, but we really have three outcomes in terms of temperature that we can get, but we only have two faucets. We have hot, we have cold, but then we have warm, and warm is this combination of two, right? But more importantly, what I wanted to give with this analogy is how hot, warm, and cold can be influenced by one nozzle. So what I mean by that is if anybody's ever tried to fill up a tub to like soak in a tub, man, it's hard to get it exactly at the temperature you want. And some people like it hot, some people don't. But if the external force in this analogy is, is small, not a lot, five pounds, 10 pounds, whatever you want it to be, you put on a little bit of cold, that's the external force. That's the external influence of water temperature. Now with your muscles, I can, crank it and put a lot of hot water and the end result is going to be more hot <laughs> than cold. However, without touching the cold nozzle at all, that's an external force and that's a constant flow of cold water, I can actually lessen the hot, turn it down a little bit to match what the cold's coming out and choose to make it warm. That would be an isometric analogy in this analogy. I can choose to make it hotter. That would be like concentric. I can, by adjusting the hot knob only, I can choose to make it warm or room temperature. That'd be isometric. And then I can turn off the hot and let it be cold. I can let the cold water win. And I can do all three by just adjusting one knob. Does that make sense? That's how our muscles are influencing motion when we're doing these exercises and when we're doing activities of daily living. You usually have a constant external force. That can vary, but you've got to start somewhere. But your hot water, your muscle innervation can choose to be greater, the same, or less. So the conundrum here is how a muscle influence can be responsible for choosing to be less. So in other words, the weight, if you lower it down, technically the weight is winning, but you're letting it win. <laughs> you're, you're letting gravity be greater than your muscle force, and that's okay. That's how you're able to do another rep. And what we can't do is we can't assume. We can't say, well, the first initial movement will always be concentric. That doesn't work in all of our exercises. You know, most squats, you get into the rack, the first movement you're going to have is actually letting the weight be greater. Does that make sense? So we can't just assume these things. We have to see them for what they are. All right. So far, so bad? All right, check this out. This is where I'm going to try to make a big leap here, so please let me know if I have to repeat myself. So we're gonna get into a little bit of physics. <coughs> I understand, but it's gonna be okay. We're gonna keep it simple. Right. First thing I want you to, to see is how we always, in, 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 in physics and mechanics, we always need to define our global references, okay? So standard stuff, positive and negative x, positive and negative y. That's just so we're, we know, because remember, if you and I are facing each other and I say point right, we're both going to point in two different directions. But if we say point east, we're both going to point in the same direction, even though it's your right and my left. So these global references is, is so that we're all on the same page of what up means, down means, and our left and rights mean the same thing positives and negative x and y, okay? First thing. Now, the work, you heard me say work a lot last class. And what I want to do to, in today's class is differentiate between mechanical work and physiological work. And I'm going to try to do that in layman's terms. 
So in mechanical work, we talk about we have the variables, work is force and displacement. So in other words, we could calculate like the work that I do on this text, on this uh, yearbook, and say if I bring it from the ground to the table, and we know that this is positive y, I did positive work on the book. I moved it in a positive displacement. Okay. Negative work would be if I took the book and I lowered it down. Whether I lowered it down or I let planet Earth do it, it's still negative work because the displacement was negative based on how I defined the positive and negative. If I took the book and brought it over here, that would be positive work. And if I brought the book over here, that would be negative work. And what's really weird in, in, in mechanical work is if I do positive work and then I come right back and do the same exact amount of negative, they cancel out and I didn't do any work on the book. I mean, so it's like, that's kind of weird, like, because basically it ended up in the same place. But we know I did something. You know, I, I mean, I moved it there, I moved it back. It, that would be like saying if you did like a circuit and you were moving sandbags and stuff and you brought them back to the same place, at the end of you know, your 45 minute session, you're sweating, your heart's and you're exhausted, and then your trainer was like, congratulations, you didn't do anything today. And you know that's like, well, what do you mean? I did, I did a ton of work. So <coughs> mechanical work can sometimes play tricks in our heads because of the numbers. So what I love to do is kind of go inside the muscle cell itself where all those little cilia are moving and look at work physiologically. So notice the three outcomes on mechanical work. You could do positive work, you could do negative work, or you could do no work. And no work doesn't mean you didn't do anything, it's just zero work is the sum total of the, of the positives and the negatives. And if you, bring the book positive and then you bring it back negative, technically you didn't do any work. So there's three outcomes when you look at work from an equation standpoint. You have positive work, negative work, and zero work or no work. In physiological work, what's happening inside the muscle is there's movement happening at all times. There's movement happening. There's enzymes and receptors and the little cilia constantly moving. So I'd love for you to think of this very similarly, where when we're talking about muscles working in textbooks, it's easy to just look at the mechanical work, but that doesn't help us to understand, especially isometrics, because how are you telling me that something is contracting or working when I don't have any movement. What I mean by that is, in classical mechanics, we would say that table is doing no work on that book at all. There's forces, but because it's not displacing the book, there's no work. But I know darn well, bless you, that when I'm holding dumbbells, I'm doing something. I'm gonna get tired. So the work is happening inside of the muscle itself. And the faucet analogy comes into play here because when I'm doing isometric work physiologically, it's the hot and the cold balancing itself out. It's the sum total. It's the swimming in the endless pool where you're still moving these little cilia but you're matching what the flow of the rivers bring in, so your net movement is zero. The sum total is zero. <coughs> Think of it like this. If you have a checking account every month, you get a statement, and there's a ton, well, in mine, because I eat out a lot, but there's a lot of transactions in your bank statement. But if I start the month off at $1,000 and I get my next statement a month later that's at $1,000, I didn't have any change in my total, but I had a ton of transactions that had movement. I made some, I spent some. So that's what the little silly are doing. You make some, you, you spend some. You try to shorten, 
but you're lengthened. So it's the sum total of the shorts and the lengthens that's going to determine the outcomes of the physiological contractions. And this is what I, what I actually love about the mechanical work is we, we, we kind of we play a little bit fast and loose. But you guys have heard this before. Um, uh, make sure you go slow during the negatives. The negatives have kind of insinuated the eccentric part of that rep, right? Well, that's only because in classical mechanical work, negative work is movement in the opposite of the force that you're providing. So all I'm trying to show you is that classical mechanical work of being negative, we're going to call that eccentrics. It's the same thing. But it's physiological work that's happening for that eccentrics. Okay? So three outcomes of physiological work. Shortening while trying to shorten. There's more little cilia that are trying to shorten than what is trying to lengthen it outside, what it's trying to be lengthened. There are more actin and myosin trying to shorten the muscle than outside influences trying to lengthen. Or there's more hot water from the muscle than there is cold water from outside. And so the net result is going to be the water is going to be hot when it comes out the faucet. Yes? In eccentrics, in eccentrics, there is going to be, in eccentrics, there's going to be more external forces or cold water that's be lengthening the muscle. Remember, muscles can't lengthen themselves. Something has to be there trying to stretch the muscle out trying to lengthen the muscle out. And the hot water knob, which is your muscles, can let it be lengthened, can let external forces like gravity and the machines that you're in lengthen your muscles. While the muscle itself is still trying to shorten above rest. Think of it like this. If I was lowering a dumbbell down and magically it vanished, Harry Potter style, the muscle pulling would actually start to shorten right away because all of a sudden it's pulling with a certain amount of force to let the weight go down. But if all of a sudden that weight disappeared, it would be pulling more <laughs> than, than, than the weight of my arm. So it's still pulling more than it rests. It's just choosing to influence less then the external forces are trying to move. Okay? And then in isometrics, you have this tie. In isometrics, you have whatever the external force is trying to lengthen your muscle, you're going to choose to match it. You're going to choose to try to shorten with the same amount of influence as something is trying to lengthen it. If you put the cold full force, then you're going to put the hot full force to make it warm to make it balance. So again, think about it. You can have the same temperature out of that faucet by putting a little bit of cold, or like a two pound dumbbell, and a little bit of hot. Small innervation. Or you can crank it up. 50 pound dumbbell, crank up the cold. Well, if I want to have the same isometric, I gotta crank up the hot. They're gonna match each other. But here is where your muscles influence your motion most of the time in these exercises, especially ones that you're going to be doing multiple reps. You have a cold output, a sub-max. So let's say I could do, let's say I could do 200 pounds, but I'm going to do 100 pounds. I'm going to crank the cold halfway. So when I'm doing the exercise, I'm going to crank the hot water halfway to match it, but this is to me what's, what's, what's brilliant and elegant. When it comes time to move 
the barbell in the direction of my muscles pull, I need to take the hot and I need to crank it just a little bit more to make more force going in the direction than the other direction. When I get to the top, if I don't mess with the hot knob, I'm not coming back down. So in other words, at the top, I need to turn the hot down a little bit. I need to turn the knob down a little bit to let gravity be a little bit greater so that it can start to come down. And then when I get down to the bottom, it comes time to slow it down and then speed it up. I gotta crank the hot. Guys, that's exactly what's happening in your muscles. You're innervating, you're zapping your muscles, and you're fluctuating between more and less. Or equal, if, if you want to maintain a position. Okay? So, in your book, or in your notes, you're going to see for our, we're modifying it, because at the end of the day, any equation, if you're actually trying to solve for x, or you're trying to solve for work, then times is important, because they're relationships. But if we're just trying to understand how different factors influence other factors, then I, in the book you're going to say plus, just because to me it's easier. So, what I did is I rearranged it, if you notice, contraction equals agonist times joint motion. Because work is force times displacement. Another way of saying it is force and displacement equals work. So in the physiological context, contraction, muscle contraction, work, is your agonist, those are the forces, the intrinsic forces, times the displacement, the joint motion that you're going to And then I rearrange that one just like I rearranged the top one to show you, hey, agonist and joint motion is what contraction is. Do you see the similarities of what I'm trying to do here? Or I'm trying to walk you down the path of understanding. Now, in any algebraic equation that we had in junior high, if you have three variables, as long as you know two, you can solve for the third one, okay? So the first variable that we're gonna solve for is your agonist. That's what we've done the past couple weeks. We're gonna figure out who we need to recruit because we understand why we need to recruit it. Your body does this all the time. So for the sink analogy, you have Faucets, you don't just have one faucet in your house, you have a faucet in the bathroom, you got a faucet in the kitchen, you got a faucet outside it. So you have faucets, every muscle is like a faucet that has the hot water knob representing the innervation of the muscle. Okay? So the first thing we have to do to figure out contraction, because contraction is solved, ladies and gentlemen. We're gonna solve for the contraction, we're gonna prove the contraction. But the first variable in this basic equation is we're going to figure out who am I using? What agonistic group of muscles am I using? And we're going to solve for this one by just asking ourselves, why do we need it? Okay. So watch. Examples. Okay, let's just look at the photo on the right side. <laughs> yeah, this is my help. I always get this confused, guys. I apologize. Did it work? Yay. Okay, looking at the photo on the right side, the padding is pushing, okay? And the padding is pushing, trying to cause what motion at his knee? Flexion. It's trying to cause flexion. 
Now, yes, gravity is pulling down on the weight stack, but because of the pullings and the way the machine is designed, at the end of the day, that padding is a representation of the weight stack, right? It's, it's almost like a, a, you know, a, a, a legislation representation that, that representing the people. So the padding is trying to flex the knee. That's a big clue. If the padding is trying to flex the knee, if that's what the cold water is trying to do to our nozzle, the hot water that we need to recruit are going to be our muscles that are actually trying to extend the knee. Make sense? Don't let me push you down. You better use some muscles that are trying to pull you up. Now, you may be wondering, Campbell, why don't you just say quad? Well, we could say quad. We could say, well, who are Who's in the quad? Vastus medialis, lateralis, intermedius, radius, femoris. All that stuff doesn't <coughs> tell us what they're trying to do. So in other words, my name is Brian, but I'm a biomechanics professor. That's what I do. Vastus medialis, lateralis, intermedius, rectus, femoris is their name. <laughs> But knee extension pullers or knee extensors is what they do. Does that make sense? And I'm a professor whether or not I suck at it or I'm good at it, but I'm trying to profess mechanics for you guys. So these extension pullers, whether or not they cause it, <coughs> prevent, or allow, are still trying to do the same thing. So the first task is to ask ourselves, identify our agonist in any exercise. Who do we need because we understand why we need them? In this exercise, I need knee extension pullers that we're going to call knee extensors, plural. And it's not because they're always going to extend the knee. They're always going to extend the knee when they're working concentrically, when they're causing positive work for how they pull. But they can actually also cause extension, I mean a flexion of the knee, when they're allowing the motion in the opposite direction of their pull, and that's what we call negative works or negative. Okay? So the biggest trap, guys, is you, I still have senior biomechanics students doing this all the time, is you want to associate a specific muscle with a specific motion. And that's bad. Because you're only going to get that right in one out of three outcomes. You're only going to get it right when it happens to be concentric. Make sense? Now, if I go from right to left, that padding is still trying to flex me the entire time. Same external force trying to move me, I need the same agonistic group that is trying to move me the opposite way. <coughs> same external force, same agonist. The change of the variation in motion is going to be the change in the variation of that same muscle group doing different contractions. The muscle will influence motion through different contractions. Not different muscles, same muscles. Different contractions will influence the different motions. So watch how this would work in our equation that's in your book. I know that I'm working my knee extensors in this exercise because the exercise is trying to flex me. If I observe knee flexion, that's why we spent two months on joint motion, because it's so important to be able to see the next variable. You have to be able to know the next variable. Motion is motion. Figure out the agonist. Solve for A, observe B, and C is proven. Contraction is proven. So we know the agonist is the knee extensors. The only way the knee extensors can do knee flexion is through eccentric contraction, is through a negative, is through the context of eccentric contraction. If I go from here to there, same muscles, there's the same external force. 
So the only way my knee extensors can actually do knee extension is through concentric contraction. This is to be a positive. And if I'm holding this position, I'm still using my knee extensors. And my knee extensors are going to maintain that position or, or prevent my knee from flexing through isometric contraction. Now, mechanically, that work is zero. But physiologically, <laughs> there's a lot of work going on. There's, a, there's still hot water being poured out, even though the sum of the temperature is warm. Does that make sense? I like this analogy. When I was uh, growing up, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a hot water heater when you live out in the country. So you heat the water, and you only got so much hot water in the tank. And when you out, you out. And I think that's a good analogy here. I only have so much hot water in my tank. And so I can hold 20 pounds isometrically, and my temperature is balanced. But eventually, when I start to run out of hot water, it's going to start to, you know, start to get less and less and less and less. I'm not messing with the knob. But when I start to run out of hot water, the water is going to get colder and colder and colder, meaning the external force is going to get greater and greater and greater. Make sense? Yes, ma'am. The eccentric is going to be in the motion, is in the opposite direction of your agonistic muscle support. Yep. All right, let's do a few more. you're going to, whoa. Sorry, guys. Questions that you're going to have to answer on the test. It's like playing a game. Clues. You utilize the clues. It's like givens when we were trying to solve our equations. If you're given, you know, this, 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 solve for that. First thing you got to tackle, first thing you have to engage in, who am I working and there's no guessing game. I'm trying to teach you, you know what I'm really trying to teach you? Confidence. I'm trying to teach you confidence. I'm trying to teach you that you don't have to play this game of quads and the glutes and the hands and the cores and the bead and the bead and the bead. I'm trying to teach you that you can know exactly who you're working. There's no guesswork. You know exactly who you're working or innervating because you know why you need them. And right now, you're in a vulnerable state. There's too, guys, there's too many muscles. We got hundreds and hundreds of muscles in the body. So to we'll get there, but I want you to see who's working based off of their pull. Why do you need it? Okay? That machine is trying to do what to his needs? Extend. The last thing he needs is the muscles that are trying to extend his knees. If he used his knee extensors, if he used the same muscles as the last exercise, he would literally yank his shins away from the padding. Does that make sense? He doesn't need <coughs> extension pulling muscles. He needs flexion pulling muscles. And we're going to call those muscles the knee flexors, plural. Multiple muscles, more than just your hamstring that are pulling in a direction of knee flexion because the machine is trying to extend it. So we've established which sink we need to go to, and the cold water is turned on by that machine, and the hot water is turned on by the agonist muscles we need to place our deployments. In this exercise, so now we have context. 
I can't just say flexion is through what contraction, extension is, or what's the exercise? We don't just say muscles in motion, we have to have context. So in the context of this exercise, if you observe knee extension, the only way flexion pulling muscles are responsible for extension of the joint, do you see the opposite stuff here? The only way me pushing up on the book can be responsible for the book going down is through negative work. For my video people. Negative work. So when knee flexion pulling muscles are responsible for extension of the knee, that's negative physiological work. Or as we call it, eccentric contraction. Coming back up, knee flexion, right? Knee flexion pullers are still working because the machine is still trying to extend you. The entire repetition, the entire range of motion, that padding is trying to extend your knees. So you're going to need knee flexion pullers the entire time. The flexion part of this exercise is going to be because of concentric contraction of those knee flexion pullers. Positive work, doing what they're trying to do creating motion in the direction of pull of the muscles. Yes? All right, someone give me any slow and controlled exercise. I just want to show you that I'm not just uh, pulling ones that I have 20 years of practice on. Anything. Squat. Let's do it. Any particular type? Do it. Fine. Now, we may use not different verbiage, but layman's terms. Like I might say, um, he's coming up, or he's going down, or, but you from our first three tests should have context of what those motions would have to be. Does that make any kind of sense? So watch, this is what I mean by that. If I could pull up the picture. Yay. All right. So the first thing we need to do is establish what are the external forces? What's the cold water trying to do? And we analyze motion joint by joint. We analyze muscles joint by joint. So we need to decide what we want to have a conversation about first. It's not disrespecting all the other things. It's just respecting what the conversation is going to be first. We could have a knee conversation. We could have a hip conversation. We could have an ankle conversation. We could have a back conversation. But since we've done knees, let's do a hip conversation. Cool. Ground and gravity in this case. So in other words, planet Earth is trying to pull his stuff down. Earth itself is kind of getting in the way. And so you kind of have this accordion squeeze action thing going. What is ground and gravity trying to do to his hips? Is it trying to flex his hips or extend his hips? Flex his hips. Big clue. The last thing I need are hip flexion pullers if it's already trying to flex your hip. If you used your hip flexion pullers, you'd literally pull your feet off of the ground. And then that would really be fun. And sometimes we actually do that. Like if you were trying to maybe do like a vertical jump with a running start, you may actually pull your feet up off the ground and kind of let you fall a little bit. Not with a barbell on your back. Right? So ground and gravity is trying to flex your hips. Big clue that I don't need hip flexion pullers. I need hip extension pullers. And hip extension pullers is a great name for a group because what they're doing is in the name. Semimembranosus, semitendinosus, biceps femoris, long head, gluteus maximus. 
they're all pulling in a direction of hip extension. It's like a team name. Now if I'm using, if my agonist, I identified which sink I'm going to, and I know that I'm using hip extension pullers, that's my A, that's my force, my internal, my muscle force, my hip extensors are gonna allow flexion of the hips. Because when you go down, that's the first movement you're gonna do if you start off like here. Hip extensors do flexion through the context of eccentric contraction. You see how this works? Contraction is proven. Contraction is solved. There's no guesswork. Coming back up, that's going to be hip extension. Hip extensors are going to do hip extension through concentric contraction. Positive net physiological work. If I just hold this position for a few seconds, awesome. Hip extensors are going to maintain that position through isometric contraction. But that doesn't mean they're not working mechanically, it would be zero, but we know that's, that you can't, zero, you're putting forth effort here. That's why I want you to think of it like the sink. That there's just as much hot as cold, so the net result is neutral, but you only got so much hot water before you run out. Let's do, and, uh, God, so many things to say. Sometimes my, my brain. Let me tell you a big mistake that a lot of students make on the test. I say, okay, guys, left to right, who are you working? And students will say, oh, that has to be the hip flexors. And the biggest reason, that's why I keep saying this over and over, is because they say, well, why wouldn't it be your flexing? <coughs> They want to associate specific muscles with specific motion because that's all you've ever been introduced to. On all your little certification, <laughs> fitness tests, and some of your freshman level classes, it's these muscles and these motions. And there's zero context to it. My bicep can be responsible for extending my elbow. Yeah. So we have to look at it holistically. We have to look at it in context. I'm not saying muscles don't influence motion, but we cannot talk about it without the context of the contractions. That's part of the equation. Yes? All right, let's go knees. <coughs> On the test, I'll ask stuff like, what would be the agonist at the knees going down and what would be the agonist at the knees going up? Would they be different muscles or the same muscles? Same muscles. But a lot of students are gonna tell me that I'm using the flexors on the way down and the sensors on the way up. It's gonna happen. The important thing is do you see why it would happen if you don't understand what's happening here. And it'd be very easy to say, well, why wouldn't, just like my coach friend that I was telling you about. Chest, back, on the push-up. In his mind, it made sense. I'm doing a row motion here, and I'm doing a bench press motion there. So I'm working my knee extensors because ground and gravity is trying to flex me the whole time. Context of contraction. Where's my positive physiological work? Where's my negative physiological work? The positive physiological work is going to be when the motion matches up with the agonistic group. That's again why I love naming the groups based on their pull, is to allow the physiological work to reveal itself. Some of you are going to be ridiculously bored in the next week and a half. Because you're going to be like, dude, this is the easiest stuff I've ever done in my life. And some of you, 
you're gonna get there, it just may take you a little bit longer. Guys, I didn't learn to ride a bike until I was 12. I'm a slow learner. But once I had it, I'm like, all right, Dad, I'm going to my friend's house, two miles down the road. Once the light goes off, hopefully it'll make sense. But we have to have the context. Knee extensors are gonna do flexion through eccentric contraction, negative work. Knee extensors are gonna do extension through concentric contraction, positive work. Let's see who remembers. The last thing I'll give you guys. Who remembers why I like to use the word work better than the word contraction? Putting you on the spot here. Who remembers why I prefer that verbiage? <clears throat> Yes, what was that? Yes, that is correct. Just making stuff up. Contraction infers shortening. Think about it. Contraction. You know, when something contracts, your brain is, whoa, it's shortened. Newton's third law, action, reaction. Boy, that sounds like a lot of movement. That law has nothing to do with movement. Isometrics isn't moving, but yet we say it's contracted. So what I need you to understand is that it's physiological, not mechanical. It works if we view it physiologically, if we view it like the faucets. That yes, the sum total is warm, the sum total is zero, but those faucets are still letting out water. There's still movement happening there. So that's why I prefer term like work, physiological work, because it's still doing something, even though the net result might not be mechanical. Like, that totally makes sense. That book, there's no work being done on that book at all. But there's work being done on your cervical extension pullers keeping your head upright. You only got so much hot water before all of a sudden you got to start to flex. It's a difference. Okay? Any questions? Hopefully today was productive and uh, we'll keep progressing forward. All right, guys. We'll see you later.